It's early spring, the time of year when elvers arrive at our shores and start making their way upriver as instinct drives them to populate their species into every accessible area of fresh water, be it a river, stream, canal, lake, pond or ditch, so spreading the species around the country. This is our first healing trip of the year. The season generally warms up sooner in the south, so we've travelled to Cornwall, where it's hopefully a few degrees warmer than up north. It's really good to see the first swallows of the year flitting above the lake. They arrive from Africa about the same time that the eels start to move, after a long cold winter spent resting in silt at the bottom of the lake. I've got hold of a, a world map here and filled in with a marker pen this dotted area which is the Sargasso Sea where the European eel Anguilla Anguilla actually breeds. Um, now they arrive on these ocean currents which start with this arrow that comes up at the back of Bermuda an area steep with mystery as we all know and the currents push them across the North Atlantic and onto the shores of the United Kingdom and beyond. The European eel arrives with these ocean currents and it's actually over 3,000 miles from the Sargasso Sea to the United Kingdom. The Sargasso Sea is named after the floating masses of sargassum, a type of seaweed which is very abundant in this sea. The sea actually has a massive average standing crop of 7 million tonnes of this weed. The Sargasso Sea is biologically very poor. What life there is remains close to the surface, mainly in the top 100 feet, where it can use the sunlight that penetrates the water. Below this top 100 feet, the water is very clear, dark blue and virtually barren. This is the Sargasso Sea a vast barren ocean desert containing virtually no biological life beneath the surface layer. This sea is the spawning ground for European eels and they spawn at great depth below the influence of surface currents. The eggs then rise and hatch nearer to the surface when the larvae are less than one millimetre in length. The early larval stages can be seen in the photograph. It takes these larvae nearly three years to drift to Britain on ocean currents and during this time they actually transform from the shape they start off in to the elvers that arrive at our shores. Go. Right now we've got an eel in a bucket joined by a see-through eel, glass eel in another bucket with the two of them combining themselves together. <laughs> 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 we've got a penny to scale it up. <laughs> penny to scale, penny for scale. <laughs> oh, it's swimming now. <laughs> this, this, is a, <laughs> this is a glass here. We caught it in the, uh, in the day at Chester. They practice canoes. <laughs> the boat race. We think they practice that. It was a bit Oxford and Cambridge. <sighs> right, we've recovered now. There's the first eel we caught, just been released. And as they do, it buried itself in the... <laughs> right, now the next sequence. <laughs> oh, oh, is it dead? 
looks like it's dead. Oh, he's going to poke it with his finger. Oh, that hurt. Yeah. Oh, no wonder it's swimming about, but it fucking can't get far. I just poked its guts it's out. But you can see its eyes shine in the light, apart from the scum on the surface. Which shows you the depth of the water, by the way. This is Highway 6, folks. And there is the um, best bit of filming we had of an El Elva. Swimming its way up from the Sargasso up the, the River D in Chester, just below the tidal reaches. Got a bit tired now, so a little rest on the way. And we're going to test our camera out now, see if we can see right into its eyes. And we probably need a wide angle lens available from Jepsons at Chester for £119. The eels we fish for. wound his rod in to show us the sort of rod he uses on this healing expedition. Well, what's your rod, Pete? So the, um, the 15 pound line is quite matched in balance to the 3 pound test curve rod got enough poke to get a big eel over the rim of the net. Super, thank you. Say so that's a three pound test curve. So 
it's got a bit of poke to move a big eel. And the, the strong line will be suitable for fishing in the deep water. You need a bit of power in the butt though, if to move the, the big eel. Straighten it out and move it towards you. Water being near the sea, when we use worms, we tend to catch a lot of smaller eels because there's a big population of small boot laces or boots as we call them that you get near the sea. So we find on this water, if we use dead bait, we'll select the, the larger eels, and not get a lot of nuisance bites from small eels. So I would consider this more of a dead bait water. We had an eel last night. Pound. 
down in a bit. Well, it's morning. Where are we? Um, we're now on Busso Reservoir, St Ives, Cornwall. Um, water we've known about since the 70s. We used to fly fish it in the 70s, then they turned it into a coarse fishery because they had to lower the level for insurance purposes. Um, we took a few feet off the top of the depth. And it's only seven feet deep all over, totally uniform, apart from one bed, one weed bed over on the far side, which started to grow across the lake. Um, Still some good eels. We've had them to nearly five pound there in the past. Very rich water. And the water's just warming for the start of summer. And the carp are actually spawning. The roach are dreaming of carp have all been spawning last night. Um, the roach are dreaming of carp are all spawning at the moment. So it's like they've been spawning last night. So we're going to film them in a minute. Um, we're going to fish it for two days and let's see what we catch tonight. Awesome. 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 Awesome.
one six zero. Lovely. Should we see it going back? Yeah. Spawn time healing. This is the best time to catch big eels, especially if you're in a lake with a small population of eels and a vast acreage of water, because they love to eat carp spawn. And all the eels from the lake will be up at this end at the moment, I would imagine, because the carp have been spawning ferociously the last two days. And the big eels will be nearby because they come in and gorge on the carp spawn along with all the little roach that also attack it and then they'll curl up and go to sleep nearby gorged on spawn this has uh, been a good result for us two good eels and we've caught them by fishing near to the spawning carp First, 
thing we did with fishing this swim was to try and raise our line over all these sunken branches to fish over the top of it. We did this with a rig which, which is used a lot for fishing over rocky ledges and snags in eel fishing. It's also good for fishing over the top of weed. I can just rest this on the wheel, Barra. I'll show you how the rig works. I threaded on the line at the top a little pop-up float, like a little pilot float, which will raise the line up to the surface, freely running up the line, and it will keep your line over the snags keep your line from the rod tip running over the top snags. Now the problem with this is that you need an offshore wind, otherwise the wind blows it back up your line to the rod tip onto the shore you're on. But with an offshore wind it keeps your line up and over the snags. We thought that would be the ideal thing for here. Now further than this we used the Dyson rig, which is another rig that devised for perch fishing but all us eel anglers use it and with this Dyson rig we have a ledger on the bottom with a long link up to a run ring at the top we have a pop up float that slides up with the bead against a stop knot that will hold your line up off the bottom and over silk weed on the bottom. Then you pull tight from your ledger to the run ring pull tight to the run ring and this is how the rig will be in the water. how the rig will be in the water but it popped up off the bottom. Cool. Now this rig um, works on a lot of waters and the idea was, was quite fitting to try but it didn't work on this water. This swim was just too hard. We kept losing rigs getting snagged up in uh, underwater branches and sunken logs. So the next step we took was to try and get a lead that would rise up above the uh, above the logs. So when we wind in, we've got this vein lift ledger. The veins on it, if you give a big pull on your rod tip and wind fast, you can winch it up in the water and over the logs. Unfortunately, our lines are still snagging on the logs. I've just dragged this log out of the water, which is typical of what uh, the bottom's made up of out there. It's thick with these things on the bottom. And I'll show you how it works. This is the Sidley rig, which we use for 99% of meal fishing, but not on this swim. And what happens is that the line cuts through because the outside of the wood is soft. And I'll just show you. See how the line cuts into the wood? Then your lead will pull up against the wood and it's harder wood in the middle so it catches it tight then and you would lose your rig. So what we first of all to overcome that we dispensed with the link on the ledger and used an inline lead which uh, I shall show you next. Now this is the inline ledger that we used and we also got one that was veined. It's a veined ledger, because the veins will rise it up in the water. When you want to bring it in, you snatch on the line quick and wind as fast as you can, and it will raise it up in the water quickly. Unfortunately, although this was getting up and over the logs before it was catching in the groove, we found that the wire trace was catching in the groove, I'll do that bit. Now I'll just show you what the problem was. Although the ledger was getting over the 
bump the top and up and away the wire trace was getting caught in and that's like cheese wire that stuff and that would pull through until the hook butted up against it so although the ledger was bouncing back through uh, up and over the snags we needed something to mask the hook now what we did next we tried to cover the hook first of all I did it with a, a washing up bottle top and I'll just show you now what we did this was one of the prototypes we made a hook guard to cover the hook this is the top of the lemonade bottle lemonade pot bottle now what you have is the wire trace simple wire trace with a swivel at one end and a hook at the other now you put a bead onto that wire trace and get your hook guard with a hole in the middle and thread your trace through which you would then tie onto your main line now that will act as a hook guard the hook the bead will stop put up against the hole in the bottle the hook will pull up against that and it will be masked so that when you bounce it back over the wood it's shielded and it won't catch in the wood now this was okay but they were hard to get hold of the tops in the right sizes because they like to use bigger hooks than that the size 4's hook would be over the edge so we tried a fast array of gadgets such as these kinder egg type things and you name it we've tried it film canister case and all sorts of halves and swim feeders various little cups from kids top from an aerosol bottle now all these worked as a hook guard the kinder egg was quite a good one but the best we found of the lot was the old ping pong ball table tennis ball cool. this time of day don't you Go. Cool. so after the pot bottle top we do, tried a vast array of gadgets I've kept some of them in a tub here um, kinder egg was the obvious one with half a kinder egg being quite a good hook guard uh, film canister was quite good you can use the top of a vinegar bottle I think that is a sauce bottle various plastic tops kids domes and even top off an aerosol now we tried all these and we found the best of the lot was actually the old ping pong ball, table tennis ball, and when you cut it in half, you've got white ones and orange ones, but cut them in half, punched a hole through them, and they are perfect. Here's one that I made earlier. Now you see the bead has come butting up against it, and the hook is perfectly guarded. Now when that comes up against the log on the bottom and you're winding it back, the hook guard just shields it and it just bumps over the top. I'll just do that again so you can see. If this didn't have the hook guard on, that hook would be dragging straight into the log. It does work because when we invented it, Pete gave me an excited phone call told me just cast it over the top of a sycamore tree and dragged it back in and it hadn't snagged up. Okay. Now with this rig, when it's lying on the bottom with a bunch of worms on, you might think that the bottle top will put an eel off. It certainly doesn't because I've had it tried and tested and caught nearly every species of fish using this. Now the worms tend to crawl along the bottom anyway, so they might be 
few, crawl a few inches away from this rig, from the table tennis ball. Now furthermore, you get a lot of bites from small fish on this lake when you're fishing a big bunch of worms and they'll keep pulling a bit more line out and a bit more until the swivel, the bit that worried me was would this swivel go through the hole of the table tennis ball? Well, yes it pulls through no problem, but even if it, the swivel didn't move through there, the table tennis ball is very light and has very little resistance in the water. So I find that normally my bobbin will have risen by one or two feet and I'll have to pull another loop of line off the spool before I get an eel run because the small fish have dragged my bait away from where it originally was. Now that would leave the table tennis ball lying at least two feet away from the bait and not causing any interference towards an eel. As I said, it does work because the first two eels I caught from this swim using this rig were a 3.8 and a 5.7. So it's the rig for fishing amongst sunken logs. I believe lobworms to be the best bait for big eels. Um, actually, all of my big eels that I've caught over five pounds have been on, on lobworms. Um, it's not surprising really since you use the bait such a lot. The most traditional method of catching eels is babbing, where they get up to 200 of these lobworms and thread them onto some wool. Now, this is one of the most successful ways of taking big bags of eels, and when you consider the massive mass of worm, with 200 worms on the bunch. There's a lot of juices oozing out into the water to attract the eel. What I use is like a scaled down version of the babbing method. And just put the, put the hook close to the nose of the worm so I can fit more worms onto the hook. This is a size 4 fiddly bait holder hook which has splices on the shank. The hooks I use for these massive bunches of worms is the Sidley Bait Holder. Um, it's actually Jack Hilton Castle and John Sidley wanted to have some splices on the shank to hold the worms on. It stops them all bunching up on the bend of the hook when you cast and uh, you can cram a good bunch of worms on that. So those are the hooks I use, size 4, you can see the splices on the shank there. Now you can see that's a real good bunch of 6 or 7 lobworms. They'll be live and wriggling on the bottom and oozing their essence into the water. That's a prime eel bait, it's like a mini babbing system. Now when we're fishing with these big bunches of worms for bait, we get lots of small fish attacking the bait. And this uh, is one of the reasons why we like to use a bobbin. I actually use a plastic coated cut hanging hook. Just a simple thing that hangs on the line. Now, the reason I prefer to use that is these sorts of slips, which most other eel anglers use is that every time the fish pull the line a few inches this clip is going to pull off and I'll be up and down like a yo-yo putting the clip back on. Now with this bobbin let me just show you what happens when the fish fish is to take some line. You can see that the 
bobbin will just go up and down a few inches and then drop back. So that line would have pulled this clip right off and I'd be up and down like a yo-yo putting the split back on. So it makes life a bit easier using the bobbin. And of course when the bobbin gets to the top it just drops off anyway. And it's right, there we go, I've got a bite now. See that small lift would have actually pulled the clip off on the other rig and I would have had to come out of my bivvy and sort it out. You can imagine these are just small bream attacking the bay. Now the other good thing about these clips these um, bobbins is that with them being very light when fish swim past and catch on your line it takes your line out with a line bite and um, it gives you a feel of what's going on in the swim if any carp have been through or um, masses of bream so it's a very effective method when you fish with a tight line you don't know what's going on also I know when fish have sitting right now I'm getting lots of little bites I know that my bait's being whittled down when those bites stop I know it's time to rebait so I know we've still got the bait on because I'm getting lots of little bites now with a tight we clipped up with this clip clipped up tight you don't know what's going on and you can wind in in the morning and find you've got no worms on thinking you've had no runs that wasn't quite right then. So for me, the key to successful eel angling is to have lots of worms on the hook, a big enough hook full to feed off all the sm small fish, or bits as we call them, that attack your bunch of worms. Shy worm pickers try to economise and tend to use as few as they can get away with, rather than as many as can be crammed onto the hook. So there's lots of worms needed, and the best way to get them is to pick your own. ball on its nose. Little hybrid. It's a magical hour before dawn. The half light. The elangler is still awake. In the confusion, tiredness a long night. Time stops. Hearing sharpens. The 
mosquitoes, bedtime chorus amplifies, his pitch rises, his mind echoes to piercing tones as the hypnotic buzz dominates. A run, he hooks a big eel in the timeless grey mosquito buzz, his catch seems unreal, as though in another dimension, I see him, yet I don't. I can sense something in the swirling mist, something old, something mystical. It is the enchantment of the eel fishing. Today we're going to take a look at one of the smallest of the Cheshire and Shropshire group of mares. This mare lies in a hollow where its four acres are sheltered by the surrounding hillsides and it's enclosed by tall dense woodlands which largely shelter it from the wind. The water lies over a kettle hole, a steep sided deep hollow formed by a melting block of ice as the last ice age retreated. This results in most of the water being 10 to 23 feet deep. There's little shallow water. Few other anglers fish here because it's boat fishing only and they aren't prepared to overcome the difficulties and discomforts of boat fishing, especially at night. So I always have the place to myself each time. It's full on, only the lonely. I caught two eels, the very first time I fished this water, but it was four years after that till I caught another eel. I couldn't seem to locate where they were within the mere, even though I fished here regularly. Eventually, after a lot of hard work, I caught a beautiful eel of five pounds, 13 ounces. Sometimes I wondered if I'd ever catch another eel here. The sort of something that's about the place that keeps drawing me back. Something about the setting seems sort of historical, almost mystical. A natural mere protected from the advances of mankind by the surrounding old mixed woodland such as once covered most of the land. On one hillside, a few big old Scotch pine trees are reaching the end of their lifespan. As they hang on to life in their old age, the upper branches have died off leaving their skeleton-like silhouettes towering over one shore. Sometimes this setting reminds me of the dinosaur film, Jurassic Park. Perhaps there's even a woolly mammoth lying preserved in the silt deep down in the kettle hole. It's easy for the imagination to wander as you're lulled by the quietness of its sheltered waters, especially when you consider the potential for a monster eel. There was a deoxygenation incident here a few years ago because this mirror has got 20 foot of silt at the bottom of it that's settled in the kettle hole and that all rose up to the surface and cut off the oxygen to the fish. The fish rescue team that came to transplant the fish that were stranded, they brought oxygenation with them and revived some massive eels that were stranded here. The chap told me, I spoke to him personally, and he's caught plenty of double-figured conger eels, and he assures me that three of the biggest eels they handled were 10 pounds, and one very much bigger than the other two. And the amazing thing is nobody knew these eels were here. These eels were revived and they're still in here. And there's a lot of other eels in the five to 10 pound bracket. And like I said, nobody knew they were here.
And now there's only me that seems to fit here. I read a few books to see if I could discover why this deoxygenation incident had occurred. And I learnt about thermal stratification, in which all the maze over five to eight metres in depth will become thermally stratified from spring through to late autumn. This results in the water separating into three layers, depending on the, the temperature band. It doesn't occur in all smaller waters, but mainly in large waters and deep waters, especially maize with deep sides and very small proportion of shallow water and no inflow. So this mere has all the criteria for thermal stratification. Now this stratification results in a warm upper layer, which is known as the epilimnium, and a lower cold hypolimnium, and in between is a thin layer which is rapidly dropping in temperature. This is known as a thermocline. Within a few days of stratification in spring, the oxygen at the bottom of the lake is depleted and this increases as the season goes on and the oxygen is depleted further and further up from the lake bed until the whole area at the bottom of the lake is depleted of oxygen. Um, obviously this is going to restrict the area in which the fish can forage. They're going to have to find the oxygenated waters around the edges. Now after oxygen at deoxygenation in spring, the chemical action on the lake bed doesn't use oxygen and the anaerobic action results in the chemical products at the end are sort of marsh gas which is methane and sulphur hydrogen products. This is why your lobworms come in stinking of this horrible silt from the bottom and you know you're in the deoxygenated zone when it's like that. Conditions on this mare are uh, increased by its sheltered windless state, small surface area and deep waters. And also the surrounding woodland deposit leaves that settle down the steep sides of the mare and gradually fill the kettle hole. The lack of oxygen in the bottom waters results in a very slow breakdown of these leaves which have formed a plug of silt several metres deep lying in the recess of the kettle hole. The incident when the silt rose to the surface and deoxygenated the water occurred in spring. This is when the thermal layers all equal out as the temperature becomes even at the start of summer and this mirror is actually a potential time bomb just waiting for this deoxygenation incident to occur again. Good. Now when I take into consideration everything I've learned about this mirror and its thermal stratification I realise there's going to be no eels in the water that is very deep. Now this is most of the mere, so the upper layers are going to be oxygenated. They only touch the bed of the lake in the very edge. And the favoured shore to fish is the one with the wave platform on it. This this shore is the only one exposed to much wind action and there's actually a shallow wave platform and the water is less than six feet deep and it's got a hard bottom and the, the wind actually blasts onto the shore and sucks all the silt back as it goes back into the lake and keeps this shelf free of silt. Uh, 
Um, so at first we had a few teething problems with this boat fishing. Obviously you can't use bank sticks because it's a pump to the boat, so we've, we've used a pod and fished three rods off it. Now, although you can see a mud anchor at the end of the boat, we don't use those because it causes too much sway, even if you use one at each end, especially when you're out over the deep water and it's rough. So what we tend to do, instead of anchoring up, we tie up to the shore. Although we're not allowed bank fishing here, we tie up to trees on the bank side and fish out towards the lake as though we were fishing from the bank. Uh, we tried fishing from under an umbrella and got soaked to the skin because my feet were sticking out on the bed chair. So I've actually adapted a, a bivy fishing on here. It's just a, a cheap fishing umbrella with an overwrap stuck, stuck onto it with gaffer tape and the door is made out of Gore-Tex. It's an old Gore-Tex sleeping bag I had. I've just gaffer taped it on and that can come and cover the whole, whole area that I sleep under. It also keeps the mosquitoes out. Now, as the base, I've actually got the base from a umbrella stand. One of those that they usually fill with sand, I think. I fill this with water when I get here, save so carrying the weight, and then stick the umbrella pole in there. It's quite sturdy and I've got ties all round to tie it down if it gets rough and we'll fish on here two or three nights at a time it's very peaceful I love every minute of it so, we've had some good names for this bivvy the first time one of my angling mates saw it he said bloody hell Baz that's not the bivvy, that's a divvy so my sons now call it the divvy bivvy and when the gamekeeper from this woodland was coming past, he caught me rowing across the lake with this thing up, acting like a sail, and he said, bloody hell, it's Noah's Ark. I'm just going to try and fish this quarry. Barry says he can see people watching us, so we're going to get slung off in a minute. Hmm. What do you have to do? It's been the A team. No car park swims for us, I'm afraid. Folks, get around that bridge. When what? When you film it. When? Yeah. Stop the eel angle getting in. This is quarry workings. Deep in the middle of no man's land.
pipe must be the pipe where they pumped the water out to keep the level down so they could uh, extract pumping stations behind yeah extract the water and I follow this pipe that goes under this rock to the pumping station which is in the, the woods trees hidden away now. there we go a little shack so if the quarry shut 15 years ago, the working quarry, and they stopped pumping it out, is it actually filling up? You would imagine so. Well, we're going to plumb the depths with the depth finder, so let's see how deep it is. Let's check it out. If you get the size of it, then it's bloody... No bivvies, no carp anglers bivvies on here tonight. Look at this place. Look at that bird just going up. Oh, it's a bird of prey. First night of our poaching sessions. We've ended up here. Up, look at the top of that tree. Yeah. It's like something off Planet of the Apes. What a place. Yeah. Yeah, you can scramble up that top and it comes out. Found it. Big ears.
That's because it was wobbling about. Not the National Anguilla Club today. And that don't mean to say that we took sides with any French inclinated school teachers. Yeah. I don't believe that, that's underwater bushes that. Yeah, trees. <laughs> 